And we're live. Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew today. Luke Paddington, Justin Wynn, Dr. John Mullen, and a special guest today joining us from across the country, Laura Sogar. Welcome to the show, Laura. Woo! Thank you. Woo! Thank you for having me. Oh, music. Oh, noise maker. Apparently, Luke's got kids, so he. Gets my, I have kids. So I've got this. <laughs> Just I've as got this was started, I my my cat decided to. A Siamese. I my awesome. Oh, look at that! Yeah. I know. This is password. The special special guest. This is a password. Password. Oh. You know, because your your pet's name is always your password. You know. Ah, uh, I like that. That's good. Yeah. I, I was going to kick Already out a people. Already explaining your jokes. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. <laughs> Level one over here. I was going to kick out of people who name their pets after, like, name them a human name. Like, I, I just want to see a dog named Allison. <laughs> or so, Yeah, everyone was like, oh, password's not like a pet name. I'm like, it's a cat. It doesn't matter. I call it money <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> it's completely irrelevant what I call this thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Thing. But it's also the, the animal you can experiment with names. You don't experiment with your child's name because what happens when they turn 18 and like you call me what? Yeah, so I'm not gonna name my kid password. Got that out. Is that all true? That, <laughs> so, control or delete. Well, they say dogs respond to two syllable names much better. It's like the German command thing. But what about cats? Is that true for cats or do they even no, they, yeah, they, again they, it's irrelevant what you call a cat? Cats don't care. Oh. No, you could do. <laughs> he's actually, to be fair, he's the most dog-like of a cat that I've ever met. That's what uh, everybody. Ca- that's what every know. cat owner says. <laughs> uh, but he loves to hang out and stuff like that. But it, his his name has nothing to do with that at all. It's just like, oh, you're there. I'll come see you. Maybe you're about to be live. I'm gonna be over here now. <laughs> do you, I, do you, <laughs> does he have a nickname? Do you call him P Dub? Uh, I should. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. Some people call them the word, which feels kind of religious. <laughs> the word. The word. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very religious. Uh, Laura, what's in your uh, glass or drink tonight? So I'm drinking kombucha this evening. Um, the reason being is that I'm not. I got Botox in my forehead today. Uh, I bet that's always. A, you guys are all like, what? Oh. So um, you're not supposed to drink alcohol after that. It's all the rage. Brooklyn, baby. Okay, so this is yeah. topical because my sister's in town visiting from, uh, she uh-huh. lives in Florida. Um, and uh, there's a Botox, I don't know, what do you call it? Salon? I don't know what these things are called. Clinic? And there's yeah. this one here in town that she loves to go to every time she visits. And so she went the other day um, and I was just sitting outside. But I'm pretty sure she had wine that night. She, well, she's not supposed to. See, I'm also like, I'm I'm getting it preventatively, like very, you know, early mm-hmm. on. And so I still follow all the rules, but I bet after you've been doing it for a few, I don't know how old your sister is, but if she's been doing it for a few years, you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, typically she just goes, can you see my reaction? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm like, well, no. Time. She goes, Maybe three days, completely frozen. It'll be great. I'm fired up. <laughs> Is it a banned substance by Fina? I don't know, but good lord, I am so grateful. Could you, could, would it help you? Maybe you know what? I didn't, even look. I didn't even look. <laughs> really high dynamic on that forehead. Really high dynamic. Cap and comes down. Why not? Come on, guys. All right. Oh, here. oh god. Oh my gosh. Luke, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, the big sexy Bohemian Rhapsody, like last week. The bi- oh, that's oh wait there. Oh. Boom. Yeah, I hate doing that. And anyway, yeah, so IPA. Yeah. You and your Kickstarter beers with the <laughs> beta packaging. Justin, what are you drinking tonight? I'm joining Laura Kombucha with the yeah. Hum Blueberry. Cheers Same to that. Thing. Cheers. Oh, no oh. stay till Brooklyn. <laughs> there you go, John. What do you got? Another Pliny? Yep, that I do. Mm. Not going to the store too often, so have to stick with what we have. I'll, I'll make do though this time. That's the way that goes. Well, I could have joined Laura because I think I have a health aid kombucha in the fridge. Although I don't know what flavor that is. Um, bubbly rosé. So bubbly rosé. Oh, I haven't had that one. <laughs> That's marketing. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Absolutely. I really like the watermelon flavor of the healthy kombucha. I, I had that last week. That was really good. I haven't had that one yet. I usually get the ginger, but today I felt fancy. So. 
Clear. Ginger Lemon and Cayenne oh, Clint. Those are mine. Yeah. yeah. Like the still Rose one, right, Luke? Yeah, no. That's not the right. bubbly. The still Rose. That's so much better. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, smoke. All right. Beer. I'm drinking a Stella again. Actually, I don't know if I did that on the last pod, but I'm drinking a Stella and it's nice. You were drinking a Bud last <laughs> night. That's the no, end last time he was drinking water because he was going to go for a, a, a run on Saturday. That's right. Oh, did you run after? I did. Yeah. Brian lives in a mountain, so going for a run is like going mountain climbing for us. <laughs> what? Where did you go? <laughs> I, I just went out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, outlet like that is his front yard. Okay, <laughs> so where are you? Are you ropes on like hiking boots? <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm in the mountains between San Jose and Santa Cruz, so I kind of like pop from one side to the other. It's like uh, I don't know. Santa Clara Pool is half an hour away, and that's oh, much that's closer so to where nice. these guys live. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. You guys with your cars, all mobile. Yeah, so, <laughs> so no car in New York life. I know. I've been city biking all over the place. It's actually been great. Um, we city biked a protest yesterday. Maybe that's a good segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, so what's the protocol with city biking anyway nowadays? I mean... I mean, do you bring your hand wipes and your sanitizer or do you wear gloves or what? what's, you know, shared shared surfaces or so yeah. taboo? So I usually just uh, sanitize my hands after. I mean, I feel like you could sanitize the bike itself. I'm maybe I should be nicer and do so. But um, right after I just try not to touch my face or anything like that. But I do wear my mask. I'm pretty I love wearing my mask, to be honest. It feels like my own little my little room. So I wear that everywhere. <laughs> I think that's like, I'll bike with it. Like a lot of people will take it down for that. And I'm like, no. Oh, you do. You're one of those. See, I can't uh, in a in an urban environment like that, totally different story. Like you're yeah. in fully in it. And uh, but I see people running around here. And if you've got plenty of space, I just don't understand why you're covering up your face. Yeah. Well, and then, but, someone recently yeah. die while running with their mask on because of the CO2 building up in their mask and it being so hot, so they actually died of co2 poisoning oh my gosh I, for, that's so dream like stop running <laughs> I, know, that's, I mean i don't know if we're going to get into elite <laughs> athletics but that is certainly someone that can put their body that for well, sure. so we, were, we were talking about the um oh. the snorkel thing right the the resisted snorkel and oh. that's what the running with the mask reminds me of is putting the cap you have this lower where they put the cap on the top of the snorkel and you have like a, the, like the size of a straw and you're doing mm-hmm. hundreds with I never, I never did that. I was like, I do breaststroke. I have to breathe every stroke. So, <laughs> like, what's the point here? <laughs> um, but people certainly did, and I was that. You know, I'm all set again. <laughs> <That's unbelievable. laughs> you can go to hell with the miracles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we wanted to circle back to uh, start with. Do you remember your last swimming race? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, well, actually, that's funny because I did uh, New York Athletic Club, um, which is like the Olympic club over here on the, the East Coast. I'm sure you guys have gone over that before. Yeah. Um, so I've actually done a couple races, but my last like official race was the Olympic trials in uh, 2016 now, four mm-hmm. years ago. Uh, cool. And yeah, that was bad. <laughs> It was so slow. I mean, it was just like such a hot mess, uh, which I was afterwards. I was like, oh, time to retire for sure. Yeah, I'm done. Um, But then went on to just glory at the Nyack pool where going solid like 210, 200 IM short course, no warm up, (laughs) which isn't bad, to be honest. No, that's not bad. I I feel like that would hurt a lot if I tried. Oh, yeah. Very, very painful. Very painful. So Was there... Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, but it's been a while. And at this point, like, obviously, no one's really swimming right now. But I, I've i even kind of, I've gotten pretty busy. So I've moved out of even the master swimming. So it's uh, phased it out, you know, little by little. I run kind of now. Yeah. Which is there you strange. Go. Never saw that coming. I have breaststroker ankles and knees and stuff, which are not designed for that. No. No, breaststrokers, I'm not sure if you're really people, but yeah, I agree 100%. But you're something, and uh, so you're in the club, it's okay. We'd always but, just be like, yeah, invited to practice, like if you want, no you guys have a way, stay out of the way, <laughs> yeah. But don't, I don't know, I've swam at meets before where they had a breaststroke lane for warm up, 
And yeah, that was intense. Oh my God. So one, of, one of my favorite slash worst memories that growing up swimming was at the like junior nationals one year. Um, I was warming up for the hundred breaststroke or something. So I was doing really, really um, powerful, like fast twitch stuff in the water, um, kicking drills. And this girl is junior. So there's a lot of people who just, this is their first big meet. Dove in behind me was like an open well di um, warm up area. Dove in behind me, got underneath my feet. And I had no idea she was down there. And I down kicked on her face. Yeah. Yeah. And she comes <laughs> up and she's like bleeding. And I had to go. Like I had to go to the, I was going up. <laughs> I was like, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I got to go right, <laughs> right now. <laughs> ah. Here's, the, here's my car. Yeah, my adrenaline was pumping. I was like, okay, it's time to race. I did well though. I hope <laughs> yeah, you got the uh, adrenaline going, right? I yeah, absolutely. Up. I don't think she did that well though. <laughs> I hope you had your name on your cap. You're like, Sogar, come, we'll talk. It's okay. She did. We actually, I had to like go and apologize to her after. I felt so bad, but we you had to. Yeah. yeah. Well, my coach, didn't she jump behind <laughs> I wanted to, obviously, as well, but it was them. Um, but she jumped behind you. Yeah, like, I mean, it you was got re like, re ended. Yeah, I had to apologize more for like just I did the thing with you, but it was her fault to be clear. <laughs> well, I, I hope that you finished that interchange with her setting the record straight. <laughs> yeah, by the way, Larry David would and could be confused He'd be like, "Yeah, by the way." Yeah, yeah. Listen, <laughs> I, you owe me a apology. Okay, I was you know shaking up. <laughs> You have the un unwritten warm up rules, right? I mean, mm -hmm. now you can go to like a, a master's team or or just like a, a pool. And obviously not right now with COVID, but you'll go and people will be not circle swimming and things like this. There's so many unwritten warm up rules that are, yeah. you know, like you, you said, it's dangerous. They jumped behind you. They, de they kind of deserved it, right, Luke? She dove in underneath. Like I was like doing my kicks. I had with my hands by my side and was kicking underwater. So I was very much like moving forward, doing my thing. She dove for me. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. You're I don't think I'd want to take her. I don't. I feel like Napoleon Dynamite right now. Like I wouldn't want to take a roundhouse kick to the face from one of the best breaststrokers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> a, a PD breaststroke kick to the jaw. I, I, I remember pretty good. So I was I was in Hong Kong for work a few years ago, and I swam. There's this great city pool in Hong Kong that's long course. Like, where can you find long course water during public swimming? It's weird, but the the pool was packed, and they only had you know an hour and a half, two hours open of open swimming. So it was like everybody in downtown Hong Kong was there, and uh, and of course, like you know, I stick out like a sore thumb, and I'm you know swimming it doesn't matter what pace I'm swimming. Like it's a lot faster than anybody I'm in the lane with. And you know, that, that goes, you typically clear people out if you're going a little bit faster, but in a long course pool, there's just not enough space. You have to share a lane. I like, I, th I gave somebody like 30 meters or something before I pushed off and I wanted to do a fast effort. And I, I came up on this guy, never saw him. And I plowed like my, my fingertips and my catch like straight into his, super old loose baggy speedo and it just felt like my hand just like entered like <laughs> it was so bad and of course in that scenario as it, like in that setting he pops up and he goes sorry and i'm like no 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 i'm sorry <laughs> No, he's like, like no, I'm, trust me, you'll find out later. You are the sorry one. Like, I'm I'm in your country. Like I did this. I'm so impressed. They're swimming 50 meters. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it, to be fair, it was it was 50 meters of waiting, kind yeah. of. <laughs> all vertical like just kind of bobbing along <laughs> yeah the other thing that gets me uh while we're on asian swimming and i saw we had a guest on from singapore as somebody from uh the u.s going to uh asia to swim public pools you have to wear a swim cap in most places and then and typically in europe you know you're entering uh pools that have the little um clean your feet off between the locker room and the pool deck they have that in asia too so like that and um the the swim cap thing uh got me the first time that i traveled because you know i had lifeguards come up and go 
would you like to wear the swim cap? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. And they're like, no, 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 you got to wear the swim cap. And I'm like, oh, okay. So <laughs> and now I know that swim caps are the thing. And uh, I knew circle yeah. swim the other direction. Remember in Trinidad, you guys didn't get used to that, but circle swimming's other direction. Always gets you, man. Like driving that, out that really way. threw me for a loop at my first international meet. I remember yeah. that was like the only thing I came home to tell my parents. I was like, "Run the other way! Why do they do that?" And some clubs <laughs> do, do clockwise one lane, anti-clockwise the other lane, yeah. so that you can all come down together like that. And that's like what? <laughs> right. Well, yeah. they'll have like designated lanes for turning which way and turning the other way, anti-clockwise, as you put it. So um, <laughs> I guess so that's. Uh, that's so awesome. my so my club coach was English, and so the senior group, we swam, uh, count or whatever it is, clock, count, clockwise, and um, <laughs> Luke's so, messing everyone up. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> Carol too, uh, and so yeah, but we swam we swam that direction. So my my experience of that switch was as a fourteen year old when I moved up to the senior group, and it was my first day at practice, and I just got crossed up. And I swam like wearing regular Swedes with a group of people wearing regular Swedes. And I connected with my best friend's older brother, who at that age is like, he can drive and he listens to Rush and he's got a lifted Jeep. And I'm like, Ugh. and 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 I just cracked him like straight oh, head to no. head. And I was more like I was in pain, but I was so more than that, just mortified. Like I just moved up to the group and I just crushed this guy. He's going to kill me immediately. That was um, like the first time I tried to do a flip turn with a snorkel on. Um, <laughs> I came up in another lane. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> it's magic. Wow. Somehow I got lost. Oh, yeah. This is not where I belong. My oh, first job God. interview here in America. So um, I remember I was coaching for about 10 years at that point. And I came to America in 06 and I did a, an um, email a coach, Marissa Watts, who you guys all know. And she said, okay, Luke, come out and come and coach a couple of my summers and let's see how you coach. So I get up on deck and I'm like, all right, this is American high school coach wants to see how I coach. And I give the workout to the summers and they don't move. They don't move. I'm like, all right, let's try it again. Two lengths freestyle. They're like, this looking at me because you guys don't say lengths, you say laps. See, they had oh, no right. idea what I was saying, and it went on for about five minutes. I didn't know why they didn't understand me. Imagine, am I like this is going well? Okay, we still don't know what the hell you're saying half the time, so I That's completely true. understand that they That's were why I'm here. That's why I'm here, <laughs> Mr. After, Worldwide, right, Justin. <laughs> after our last episode, my sister actually was like, I could understand Luke better on that. See, I'm acclimatizing, I'm learning the language. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so I wanted to tell a Kim story because you swam for Kim for a little while. Uh, I did. Yeah. So I swam for Kim for a couple of years at Auburn uh, when she was a co head women's there. And um, I told this, I was actually telling a, a previous guest this is off air and um, air. <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah, that yeah. Like, Where is the internet? But so. Okay, so my first week at Auburn, I'm, uh, yeah, new freshman, just to set the stage. Like, I was pretty, I was, I was good in high school, but I wasn't nationally recruited. I got, I couldn't get recruited by Texas. My best friend in high school went to Texas to swim, and I tried to get Eddie to recruit me, and he wouldn't, um, or, you know, smaller class, I don't know. So, I, but, you know, like, I was, I was, I was okay, but like state champ in Georgia, but not like, but I still went on a book scholarship. So just, you know, in terms of the totem pole, when you enter college swimming, I was not like an elite. And so um, my first week on deck, you know, college coaches are still out recruiting and doing stuff and not everybody's there. And like some coaches are coaching at worlds or whatever. And then, you know, they may not all be on the pool deck when you get started. And so my first, I probably had like three or four days of practice first. Um, and then Kim was on deck for the first time, like midway through the week. I get out of the pool. Um, and I, I remember like exactly where I was in this moment. I get out of the pool and I got out like the same way I would normally get out of the pool. I put like a knee on the bulkhead and deck. Oh, and, I, she knows the story. Yeah. She knows and I stand, I stand up on the deck and, and Kim Bracken's there. And she said, Hey, um, I don't think we've met yet. I'm Kim. And I said, Hey Kim, I'm Brian. She goes, Great, nice to meet you. Get back in the pool and get out like an athlete. Why? 
no <laughs> <For what> reason. <laughs> and I, I, that was such a welcome to college swimming for me, but also such a just slap in the face. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. And I've, I've never forgotten that. And the, and the last episode, we were talking a little bit about like, okay, what's that adjustment like for a male being coached by males? And then to have uh, like a strong female presence on deck and, you know, and kind of setting me straight was an adjustment for me in that, in that time. And, yeah. um, you know, and that's, and that's different. And, uh, you know, there's certainly, so Texas was a school where, and you see this a with a lot of women's swimming programs specifically have women head coaches, but we don't see it at all on the men's side. Mm-hmm. Um, but Kim was a strong personality. So, uh, yeah, I just want to share that story with you, but what was your yeah, experience? Yeah, no, and I mean, so she has like a lot of military background, her husband and mm. stuff like that. So I think she really brought that into her coaching style, um, which I can definitely understand. And for some, it, it all depends on like what you respond best to. Right. So I can definitely see for maybe, I don't know what you were like at that point. Maybe you needed to be told to get back to school a couple rounds. Right. I did. Um, me personally, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. I swam for Chuck bachelor up in Bluefish, Like, we did the craziest shit in training ever. So at that point I was like, I'm going to, I'll basically be rolling my body out of the pool. <laughs> like, that's success for me. If I'm so tired that I like can't get out, like, you know, so I don't know. I think it's just a difference in like what is motivational for you. Um, and definitely, I mean, the Texas guys are, they're all over the place, but when it comes to actually doing work, just being really serious. And I think that's really something that she really tried to bring to practices is like, making sure that you're respecting the work that's being done and stuff like that. But like we screwed around so much. Like that was my class's like main thing was just like playing jokes on one another and just being general shitheads for the most part. But like we worked really hard at the same time. And frankly, from my perspective, like it was impossible to like be that serious all the time and take everything that hard and then not just get weird anxiety issues over it. Like it's, we're, we're going back and forth in the pool. It's not worth having like a full meltdown, you know, which I've definitely done a couple of times. So right. I always perform better when I was just more relaxed. Like we used to do flips out of the water and like all sorts of stupid stuff where you'd grab the, grab the side of the deck. <laughs> um, I don't know. That was my ideal training environment was just like screwing around with people as much as possible. But yeah, we all, uh, I don't know. We, uh, yeah, I think that is the best environment. I mean, I've told the story a little bit, but like um, one of the pre NCAA uh, rituals, I guess, or rites of passage was if you made the NCAA team at Auburn, you did a naked 10 meter jump. Uh, I don't know if they still do that today, but <laughs> like. Auburn. <laughs> yeah. You'd be amazed. Some of the fastest I would swimming. imagine that might not be the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but exactly. Those like weird little traditions like that that are they just make it fun, you know? Yeah, I think so the one that ours doesn't have, like, Sorry, like uh, uh, internet issue. I, I was gonna say I think that the one that doesn't happen anymore at Auburn is like we used to take the grate off the bottom of the pool in the deep end, and there was like a, a grate that ran the full 25 yards of the width of the deep end because it was all one tank there, and we took the ends of the grate off. And the, the like test of fortitude was if you could go the depth of the deep end, 18 feet below the grate underwater, 25 yards across, and then up to the surface and make it and not freak out because in the middle of the pool, you're swimming in like this much space trying to kind of like shimmy your way through. But we had, it ended because we, at one point they drained the pool and like repainted the bottom of it. Somebody. Yeah, but there was there was one guy, this uh, a freshman, yeah, who like freaked out at the last minute, and he was like trying to force his way out of the of the grate, and got all cut up and everything. And then it was like, okay, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, that's 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 one of those ones where it's like if you read about it in the news, you're like, oh, that was obviously going to go wrong. But it's like when you're in the group mentality where you're like, oh, we've always done this, like. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> afterwards, looking back, you're like, yeah, that's obviously going to have some issues. Maybe. At some point. Why? Why? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe, maybe like a tinge back on lighthearted fun would have been just fine. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I talk to my non-swimming friends about that they completely look at me on like, what did you just say? And I take it quite like I say, yeah, I mean, um, 
I get shaving. I, I must shave this way. No, my face, my legs are like, how do you know that? Oh, I'm, I was complaining about my tan lines. My tan lines are disappearing. And I, I stick pride in that. I mean, surely in your routine now, um, Laura, uh, those who don't know, she's a um, standard comic, which is one of the scariest things that one can do, I can't imagine. But um, is- you must have so much material of all the nonsense we do, from shaving yeah. to tan well, lines to drug it's testing. Really, it's really funny that, like, I've been trying, so I've been trying to get this bit about um, getting drug tested, like, to work, but the amount of work it takes to explain the concept as a whole in the first place and like why you're getting why you yeah. from someone else and Can like set up mm-hmm. all yeah there's so much that goes into it that the audience is like what <laughs> it's so far-fetched. like why would you be okay peeing right. from somebody who's watching you with a witness who's your friend watching you as well and that is a legal thing that the law needs and also you know? like you swam because I use a lot of my other jokes aren't even about swimming at all. So then I have to like, oh, and I swam and oh, like a lot. Like I swim a lot. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know what a lot yeah. means. Like what, ten laps, twelve laps? You did right. So it's it's very. I'm still getting like. I mean, I'm still early in the stand-up comedy world, so I'm sure I'll continue to write more about it. But um, being able to explain quickly the context of where you're coming from and then also make it feel relatable because yeah I, I do have some jokes about like you know trying to make an olympic team and the audience is automatically like you want to feel self you want to be self-deprecating as much as possible in comedy it just helps yeah. the audience connect right you like want to feel like you get what they're where they're coming from Uh, And it's really difficult for them to like relate to you when you're like, oh, I was a professional athlete or I was, you know, trying to make the Olympics and I trained my whole life for this. And they're like, oh, we, I, I'm trying to pay my mortgage. Like (laughs) what? (laughs) Completely different. So, but I mean, there's ways to do it. I'm just learning still. I'm, you know, early levels. So it's one of the more challenging things to accomplish. Enjoyable though. Yeah. It's intelligent, creative and challenging. That's what you like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's really fun. Um, It's one of those things that I haven't had something that I've really been trying to master a new skill in. I mean, obviously of your work stuff, but that like you're, you know, paid and whatever you're accomplishing things for the company, which is cool. Um, But just a new, you know, skill set that's just completely foreign and watching myself get better has been really, really cool because it's the same as swimming. If you go and you spend the time, even if like some days you leave and you're like, what was that? <laughs> that was so bad. But then other days you're like, oh, wow. You know, one month ago, I wouldn't have been able to do it as well as I did there. And then my favorite part is just the fact that it <clears throat> seems like it should be so easy, but it's not. Like I'll plan my wording of a new joke or whatever it may be. And I still can't seem to bring it across to the audience in the way I want. So there's so many like small technical things that I've taken from getting better at swimming and applied to the comedy world, which has been like, I've tried to film or record my sets as often as possible. So you can see, you're like, oh, is my elbow like too high, too low? Like like my first time I noticed I was running around the stage way too much because I was getting nervous and it was just, I wouldn't even think about it. So uh, it's been really, really interesting taking all those skills that I have from the swimming world and applying them in this sense. So I talked about our world. Though. Our world is quite objective. Our world is just like what you put in, you get out, and yeah. it's a time, and it's nobody judging you. It's not, and that's why I don't want to do synchro. I mean, besides other reasons, I can't do synchro. Um, but I don't want to be judged, <laughs> right? You <laughs> are. That was the other option: synchro or <laughs> synchro <laughs> swimming. That was it. How's the male Trinidadian synchro team, yeah. by the way? <laughs> How is a synchro team in general? Oh, what do you call it now? Yeah, it's it's hilarious. Oh, it's, um, artistic, it's music, artistic dancing or artistic, or artistic uh, swimming <laughs> is what it's called. Like That's Cutting not being a name. But you might bust a joke out for us now and think, and we laugh our heads off, and you bust it out tomorrow, and the audience goes, "Oh, or is that absolutely. common like technicality that once you nail, most people will get to that level? Like you, can you judge it? No. So yeah. that you're you're real, well, you have to. So there's a couple things with that. I'm in New York City, and the the stand-up comedy scene here is huge. It's really, really competitive. So at the level that I'm at still, yes. I, I can do some book shows. Like, I've gotten, you know, to know enough people at this point um, to get to there. But for the most part, these are, like, open mics. And open mics in New York are really different than, say, the Bay Area or 
Texas or wherever it may be because there's only other comics. So it's like very aggressive. Like no one is, you know, they're, they're not very supportive a lot of the time, which is really interesting. And also there's the whole thing that there's not that many women in comedy. So that's a whole other subject. Um, but you're not like, so you're trying these jokes and you're not necessarily going to get a reaction or if you get any sort of reaction out of them, then you're like, Oh, a real audience is going to love that. So it's always, it's very interesting trying to explain it to like people who don't know the comedy scene as well. Cause it's like, it's literally like going to practice like with your teammates and you just get like, you're practicing saying these things and you're trying to feel out if it feels funny, then you might get a couple times where you get a small reaction. You're like, Oh, that'll be good. Um, you're trying to you know network and get on real shows where then you can do it in front of a real audience and get an even bigger reaction. Or I've been lucky cause I travel enough for work that whenever I travel, I'm able to either get on shows or do mics there where there might be audience members and I can yeah. like really get my material in front of people. So, um, it's a really, I didn't realize how in, interesting of a process it was going to be. And starting in New York is also very unique. Um, okay. Like it's, it's like starting in like training on a college team where you're like, yeah. oh, you're, you're just going to, you know. It's going to LA. <laughs> are, are people surprised when they hear, people who you swam with, are they surprised to hear that you're doing what you do? Or that's just like, you know, people knew Laura, that's what she would do. And she's just, yeah. <laughs> like that surprise but <laughs> um, <laughs> I did I did improv comedy in um when I was swimming so the last couple of years um I did it at Cold Town Theater in Austin Texas wow. but it was very like low-key like I took a couple of classes and I had a little troupe and um uh, improv is like the exact opposite of stand-up it's extremely supportive you know everyone's yes anding each other nothing is prepared whatsoever um and also there's no like career in it at all <laughs> it's pretty much you do it and that's it <laughs> and it's really fun but that's really the the extent of it um and then when i came up to new york i did some improv at ucb theater um and then now i do i switched over into stand-up stand-up's frankly easier on schedules too and i find it just you know i'm a control freak we did individual sports here you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't want to work with a team <laughs> hey. do, you do, you, have a, do you have a coach yeah i was gonna ask you do you have a coach for, for stand-up? Yeah. No. No. Um, I mean, I love classes. Like, I'm a huge fan. So I took a stand-up class. But it's actually usually a lot of people don't do that. Um, you just go to the mics. Um, but I am I obviously have a unique situation. My, my boyfriend is a professional comedian. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we started our podcast. Because I'm in a unique situation where I can, like, ask him questions and stuff like that. And you typically a, a more you know, established comedian wouldn't have the patience, but we live together. So he has to listen to me <laughs> ask all my questions. Absolutely. So, <laughs> trapped him. <laughs> Do you feel like- um, so, Sorry, go ahead, finish thought. Oh, no, that was basically it. So so now, so we decided to record it so that other people could benefit as well. Yeah, that's cool. I want to get into that. Did um do you feel like you can tell uh when you're at an open mic or when you're interacting with other comics, you can tell like who's good at uh kind of self coaching? Because I mean, you you went through a college career and then a professional career and had multiple coaches, and right. so like you navigated the path of okay, how do I analyze my video to stroke technique, etc. And then like that's some that's a skill set in a like a knowledge base that translates. Um, yeah, but, but other people who haven't had that that experience of hey, the goal takes a long time to to like develop and get to. I, I would imagine I'm just wondering if there's some people you come across they're like they get easily frustrated. They're definitely not going to make it, but you can. Right. See well, I mean, you're you're absolutely correct. I'm if you if you're just like going in there and you're not really trying or you're not taking it seriously when you go to a mic, you're going to struggle. But then if you get put too much anxiety on it at the same time, like you're going to burn out really quickly at the same time. But on the other side, um, comedy is not like Luke, you were saying like swimming is very binary. Like, did you go right. faster or not? You know, right. what was your time? Comedy is not that. So you yeah, could be, like, there's all these different scenes in comedy. So you could be really good in one area, like all comedies, they're not very jokey. Like they don't have like punchline setup, those type of jokes. 
which I tend a little bit more towards, but they're more story oriented. So you might see someone who really flourishes in that area, but is um, not going to be as good in the clubs or whatever it may be. So there's a lot more ways to be successful in comedy. And then of course, you know, it's a lot of it's on social media and stuff like that. So someone could randomly pop for no damn reason, like for like something stupid, for some like TikTok or whatever it may be. Um, so, like it's like the weirdest thing. So, so many more paths to success. But I do agree with you, like being able to have the the mindset of understanding, like taking it seriously. Like it's like you go to practice and you have to go to practice as many days as you can and just get your reps in. And also like understand what your goal is in that rep. Like, are you working on your technique or are you trying to work on new material? So some of those um, perspectives that I have from working with some of the greatest coaches in the world, in the swimming world especially, as I think it's helped me, but I guess who knows? <laughs> and that's the other thing is just kind of accepting like, uh, you know, what, like in swimming, you were always going for that faster time or the, you know, bigger accomplishment or qualifying for whatever it may be. In stand up, you, I mean, if your goal is to make a ton of money, then like you shouldn't do stand up. <laughs> There's just very little money in it. It's like, you know, so do something else. Um, so really like, why are you doing it? You're doing it for you or you're doing it to, you know, to make people laugh or like, cause you enjoy it. So what are things that you'll do to, you know, help in that process so and i've been trying to be a lot more reflective of that especially like i've already done a 20-year career of going after you know binary goal after like you know trying to just jump up the ladder as much as possible um and in the comedy world i really want to make sure that i'm doing whatever i want because <laughs> like, it's like it's it's fine you know it doesn't matter um so Laura, but it's been really fun Explain to the ignorant, well, at least I'm ignorant of this. Um, I These guys don't believe I wasn't always this fast. There's a one point I wasn't as fast as I am now, right? Early in my career. That's because I trained hard and I got faster and faster. But aren't, yeah. aren't the greats always, weren't, weren't the greats always funny? I mean, wasn't Robin Williams, even though when he was 17, he was not the Robin Williams we know, wasn't he still funny? And isn't that isn't it still that intangible that you have? Or you have to really bring that to the surface? Yeah, no, I, that's a great point. And I would say probably some of them for sure. Like some people are just, you know, extremely charismatic or maybe funny in conversation, but that's not necessarily going to translate to stage funny. It's kind of like someone who's like a practice phenomenon, like might not be that good in a race. Like we unfortunately always know that one friend where you're like, ah, oh, so tragic. <laughs> Guy or girl. Um, and it's kind of, comedy like so I think that was one of the things that I really picked up from um you know living with Matt and watching his processes writing a single like five minutes worth of material could take six months or so to develop um and the first probably month or so of a new joke or a new premise that you're working on it's probably not very good uh it takes an extremely long time and a lot of reps to really be able to fine tune the um, the wording on it, understand where the punchline, it's a lot more technical than you might think, which is when I figured that out, I was like, oh, this is, that's really cool. Like you get to, yeah. there's an actual kind of like a little bit of a science behind it to an extent, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a combination of like having the sense for what might be funny, topics that might be funny and kind of blending the two and understanding the structure. And that's something that Matt's really good at and he's gotten a lot faster at, and I'm gonna be a lot slower at writing because I'm still learning all that at the same time. Um, I'm sure there's probably people who are able to go up. I mean, there's definitely people who can go up and riff and, you know, are just those overly just, you know, the, the personality types where it's very funny all the time. Um, but I would say I'm a little bit too like type A to <laughs> really pull that off on stage for people. They're like, uh, so I need to have my, my set done. Can you tell, can you tell like in swimming and in swimming, right? All of us can tell what kind of swimmer that person was within two strokes. I can see two strokes of you. I'm like, yeah, that person's from high school. They swam international. That's an elite swimmer. You can tell right away. Can you tell that with comics as well? Like that's already seasoned professional that somebody who's done at the highest yeah. level. You can just see, right? It's so polished and finesse. Yeah. It's like that, I guess. Um, I would say so to be yeah. fair. And actually that's interesting. Like when I first started, um, 
going with Matt to shows, like to stand up comedy shows, like he's he does it professionally, like he makes money off of it. So most of the shows he was on are more established ones, like he right. performs regularly at the Comedy Cellar. Um, and I would go with him and watch the sets and just be like, okay, well, <laughs> I, I would never be able to do that. And I'm right, like I'm probably never going to be able to do that. But I remember going to one of the open mics to to hang out with some friends at one point and watching that and I was like, oh, I can do that. That's much, like it's watching yeah. like a, yeah. um, a, you know, 10 and under me where you're like, oh, well they're like, they're little, you know, but obviously right. we don't have the age oh, involved. Yeah. You know, they're, they're just learning how to do this. And that is something that is much more, I can accomplish that rather than just being like immediately needing to qualify for Olympic trials. There are steps in between, you know? So when you do see someone though, who is like, professional level you can generally the confidence and you the yeah. the level uh, there will be different tastes still like you might not find them funny but you can generally tell like oh they're they're good they know what they're doing at the minimum you know i, yeah. I it. go ahead brian i was gonna say well so i <laughs> so when i was 12 i was a breaststroker yeah you were yeah, and that was the only time I was ever a breaststroker. And I, well, I did end up beating that breaststroke time in Masters. But anyway, I was like, <laughs> done with the phases of like a backstroker to butterfly to breaststroke to sprint freestyler. And um, like you're early on your comedy journey, but like, what are you right now? What do you do well? God. Or like, what are you working on? Um, I'm been, I don't know. I guess maybe I've been trying to do some of the story stuff just because I have so much weird life experiences like i've really been working on this drug testing bit um but it, again it's been very difficult to to really you know get it all pulled together uh and then i also have some more easier stuff like about relationships and you know things like that so um i don't i would say i probably fit more into the club comedy if you're trying to do like <laughs> club comedy versus alt comedy versus sketch comedy versus whatever it may be mm -hmm. I would probably be more on the club side because I have, um, I just, I don't talk about a ton of social issues because I'm a, you know, pretty boring white girl. <laughs> but, but you have. You give a hot take. You know, it's <laughs> but you've touched on some serious social issues and the segue to something more serious, but, and, and we laud you for, yeah. um, for, for, you know, the, the post that you wrote in response to Matt being on Conan um, and, yeah. and, and, and the sexism. And, and that, that's an interesting topic I like to talk about too, because you, you sort of, um, to say that you know I wasn't judged for who I look like and what I but just who, who I was when I swam but yeah. now, not now uh, and then you did put some posts too about what's happening with Black Lives Matter as well in uh, music videos yeah. so you are talk about that talk about that I like, care yeah, you yeah have absolutely like I'm I mean on the one hand I, I'm not like big on you know Facebook or posting a ton of of stuff but on occasion you know there are things that are you know it's always like <laughs> I feel like I have to get on my soapbox. Like the whole, I feel like all all of the community right now is like preparing for their talk show bit. <laughs> like, what am I? <laughs> you know? um, but um, the the Conan thing, I'll talk about that first. Was really interesting. That was a, just a really tumultuous summer. Um, that was the summer that I retired. I didn't retire um, like I wanted. I obviously wanted to make the Olympic team, and I did not. Um, I had swum like three additional years to do so. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I've made peace with all of that. I had a really wonderful career. I got to go get paid to go all over the world. So I, I feel pretty good about it. Um, and I have a much cooler story now that mm -hmm. it's much funnier to talk about missing making the Olympic team than it is to talk about making it. So, <laughs> you know, there's a there's a little silver lining for you. Um, but it was, I remember, because it was the day like of the opening ceremonies and Matt was on Conan and he had a really great set. It was really cool. And he got, he, they got posted on Reddit and made it, I think to the front page. So obviously with that come, yeah. So with that comes just a sh ton of comments on it. Yeah, um, and yeah, and I was like all excited for him and reading through and then like, you know, get a, get a couple down and you're like, they started talking about his, his girlfriend and someone said, Oh, she's like really beautiful. And then someone says, Oh no, like, uh, like pulled her up and then pulled up pictures of me. And then they started talking about like, oh, it should have been like, and then they were pulling up pictures of like models and stuff. And I, I thought he'd be with someone like this. Like it's, again, it sounds really bad when I, when I, I mean, it wasn't like fun um, at the same time. So they were like having a debate 
on the opening ceremony day, it was mentioned in one line. Like, remember, if you Google my name, if you're doing enough research to find my name, there's pages of swimming articles and like things that would come up. Maybe one person mentioned that. Hmm. Everyone else was focused 100% on what I looked like. Yeah. And that I wasn't in their minds hot enough or whatever um, to, anyway, to be dating him, which was, it was so ridiculous on so many fronts. And I was just like, I'm so, <laughs> so fed up with all this. I was really upset. And That's then true. I was like, I'm really sure. grateful that I had the, you know, I, I knew that it was bullshit. And I was like, I'm very grateful that I've been raised in a way and I've been around a type of community that could kind of encourage me to understand that that's ridiculous, you know, like, and that there are so many other things that I offer. But the fact that like the first thing that the internet sees and will always, or that they've always seen to up to this point in women is what we can offer in, you know, what we look like is it's just really damaging. I think to a lot of young women who don't have the the background that I do and the support systems and like the strong education and, you know, uh, I have a lot of things going for me, so I, I'm fine from the whole thing, but I was still pissed. You know, I was like, God damn it. <laughs> you did something about it, so it was great. Yeah, so I posted yeah. about it, um, yeah. got a lot of positive reinforcement. A lot of people were like, you're pretty. And I'm like, that's not the point. No. But should be okay. no. Thank yeah. you. Uh, like, so where, does uh, that, where, does that, where does that come from, though, Laura? Because my sister and I were talking about this, that little girls get told they're pretty. Um, yeah. And whereas boys don't get told they're handsome, they get told like you're strong or something yeah. of that nature. And it's, but it's, you don't often hear little girls being told, um, wow, you're so smart or, yeah. uh, you know, and I think, so I just, what, what was your upbringing? Like where, how do, how do you think that like, you know, you described from where you came being preparing you for that. So what, yeah. what's the about your background? So my, I think it's partially that here, I want to show you this real quick. This is like the best. Can I share screen? Yeah, oh my God. Interactive. Do it. First time a guest is doing it. All right. Yeah. Production value increased. Yeah. Right. Okay. We've got this like cool. Um, nice. Let's see. I'm just going to show a whole window for a second. So you see this, this is like this. Uh, can you see it? No. John, you gotta let us in. Let oh, you gotta let it in. It's not showing up. So there should be a share screen button on the bottom of the stream yard. Yeah, I did that. I'm not seeing it. Justin, are you seeing anything? Justin's got a green light. You can just do a head motion. Mm. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yep, yep. All right, I got it in. Yes. So this is like the cover of a girl's life magazine. This isn't even that long ago. This is in 2016. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that looks a lot older. <laughs> but anyways. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. That's a there's other things to look into there, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but point being, um, so wow. you can just see the stuff that's like being in, you know, this is for the same demographic, like, you know, young, young kids who are buying magazines like, you know, girls' life, boys' life. And the stuff that's being encouraged for them for one group versus the other. Um, this is just a small example of it, right? But at the same time, like it has impacts on people. Um, I'm really lucky that my my parents, like I swam since I was have memories. Like I started competitively swimming at five. Um, and I was good, young, because I was so damn tall. <laughs> really tall. <laughs> so, five nine in fifth grade or something. How tall were you? I was like, yeah, like five five eight or something like that. I was almost like a full grown person by like yeah yeah. I was like taller than all the boys, and I was really competitive too. You know, it was part of what helped me be good at sports. But at the same time, um, it and I was competitive in the classroom and stuff like that. And my parents were always really holding me to that standard. My mom's. German. Um, she also grew up like all over the world. So she has, you know, a lot of cultural norms that aren't necessarily American. Not that this is just an American problem, but it was one of those things that was, you know, she encouraged, you know, she was always like, there's a million pretty women out there. Like, that's not even something to worry about offering. Like, <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're relying on that, you're not going to get very far. And I was like, that's a great point. And then um, my dad, I think he like was pretty sure I was a boy for most of my life. He's he just raised me like I 
a sip of wine, hundred <laughs> um, percent. And he loved my swimming, and he was really, really supportive of all that. He would like make me do math flashcards growing up all the time. So it was. Um, I mean, I wanted to be an engineer for most of my life growing up. I was started in chemi, um, and then switched over to the econ business route because couldn't do labs with swimming, which is it's fine. It actually worked out for the best. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's AM. Yeah, no, I know it's tough. Um, but I think that just really helped me to develop that confidence around it. Um, and just having the success in sports really gave me the confidence around it. But the point is that I think there's a lot of really good stuff happening in society right now that's helping future generations. But my generation is really one of the first ones that's been able to, that the women have really been able to fully support themselves on their own. Like maybe our parents' generation has some people who are afforded those opportunities as women, but like, I don't need to worry about getting married to like for support. You know, it, I have a job. I could not if I wanted to. Um, you are talking to an underlying systemic bias still in, in the magazine, and 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 you know, swimming is is a, a big fault of that. I, I mean, it's not it's it's not as bad as it seems to have been in the in the social media world. Absolutely, you pointing to, but we talked about this on our show on Saturday with Coach Kirsten. The 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 um the bias in swimming, the fact mm -hmm. that um the mile is now being introduced next year in the, in the Olympics, the fact that um you know how many how many female coaches coach men NCAA teams less than one percent I bet far less coach female Olympic um um, um teams um you know the, luckily I believe the equal numbers of participation of the swimmers of male and female there's still separation of the two. And a lot of times they train separately, but in terms of who runs it and who sees as the authority on on the sport and the guide our sport, from coaching to administration to you know, it's this there. Did you experience any of that stuff, or how do you feel about that? It's an yeah, sport. I mean, again, we were talking a little bit about it earlier with the, the Can, there's not that many female coaches out there. And, I would say, I mean, I was really lucky to swim under, um, you know, several, yeah. uh, and I really enjoyed swimming under female coaches. I swam very well under them. Um, but I also think that there's representation really matters. Um, and there's not that many people who, again, there's not that many women who've been afforded these opportunities in the first place yet. Yes. So to go up the ranks in female coaching or like as a woman in coaching world requires not just, you, you wanna have role models, right? And there just haven't been that many for, the, I mean, there's a couple like Terry McKeever's obviously been there for a really long time. There, they, there are a few. But you could, I mean, it's got to be at least 10x in terms of for like the amount of men that there are. Um, so that kind of stuff matters. And it takes, these changes take generations to really occur. Um, and the fact that the other side of it is like a lot of women right now, I work in cybersecurity. It's something like 15% women. It's extremely low. So, you know, women are going to kind of go into all of these industries, you know, over time. But it it takes a while at the same time. I have a lot of friends who are coaches now and I'm sure they'll continue to move up the ranks and you know get promoted up there. So I think that that kind of growth needs to be encouraged by the systems as well and then you know putting them in positions of power within the organization as well. I have no idea what the numbers are for FINA um, yeah. you know groups like that. I frankly be surprised if they're super uh, uh, hardly any i mean i think christy <laughs> is, is the athletics rep right christy coventry is the athletics rep still but and, and it's funny because our sport uh especially in my day because i'm i was born in like the 19th century almost um <laughs> in my day you did not see swimming you got a magazine in your mail once a month and you saw this mm -hmm. results of me right. and you just saw laura soga 223 best time 200 breaststroke and that's how i judged you i but i judge you like that you know that laura who's that 223 it's amazing you know and therefore if laura was then invited to the show i would judge you based on how good of a swimmer you were just because i i didn't care i didn't care what you looked like right and, and a lot of times coaches are seen like well you must know swimming because you were a fast swimmer so i'd want you to coach me and if you're a fast swimmer based on your time and so there's a disconnect there somewhere isn't there right yeah no absolutely i mean also going to the fact that being a successful swimmer does not mean you'll be a good coach. Absolutely, right? absolutely. I, yeah, sure. it, it takes a much different skill set to, to be good at inspiring people to absolutely. do hard work day in, day out than it does to just like get your own shit together for a second, go a fast time and then have that be the top time for a while, you know? 
Um, so yeah, and I would say that the rotation component really does matter quite a bit. And then also, I think it's something that needs to be encouraged to like active encouragement from the top down to maybe bring more people into those first initial programs or stuff like that. Like, I think that's something that we're trying to do more of in security is to encourage women to, you know, see this as a career path that might make sense for them because there's is such a, a rapid, um, you know, difference between the two, the, the representation between the two groups. So um, yeah. more programs in place for them to feel comfortable even entering the conversation in the first place. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm almost always the only mm -hmm. one in the room. So I, that takes a very specific personality type to be okay with. Mm -hmm. I work in tech as well, Laura, and um, I work for Cisco Systems. And um, you know, oh. only recently we've had half of our board be female, which is fantastic. That's huge. Um, and yeah, half. And that, but that was five years five years ago. It was not that a CEO change changed it. Um, and there are, but we've there are active programs in place for mentoring, for sponsorship. For from the um, you know, I work for one of the top um, lead, um, female leaders in tech right now, um, who's fantastic, Maria Martinez, who's a Latino as well, and um, you know, and she drives something called a multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect is all about paying it forward and helping you forward, and 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 literally taking somebody and helping them through the system and being an active um, uh, guide in this. And I think we need we need this in swimming. In swimming, we had this, and you need it in tech. You need it in um, in policing. You need it in. Uh, Top topic right now, you know, you're right across the board. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just being more conscious about like the kind of the groups that we want to see represented, so that it actually kind of represents the the folks that you're, you know, providing service to, or you know, USA Swimming represents the USA as a whole. And it's really cool because, I mean, to be okay. honest, um, some of the the biggest stars in swimming right now are absolutely the women. You know, yeah. Um, I haven't been following quite as closely, but like. And obviously, <laughs> this poor year <laughs> has gotten completely messed up. <laughs> Who knows? So, what speaking uh, of that, uh, what's it what's it like right now? Um, trying to, I mean, <laughs> I feel like most things at 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 a, at the right time can be fodder for comedy. But is, <laughs> I mean, are you writing jokes right now? And like. <laughs> there a way to even learn uh, i mean yeah. it's, it's like too soon for sure but i feel like a lot of comics are probably going all right there's an angle here maybe in 10 years or i don't know when but right no you're actually this is this, the the biggest joke right now has just been the fact that this is the only way to get comics to shut up like and not do <laughs> jokes is it just it's so serious that even comics yeah. are just only you know pushing up like black Lives matter stuff and you know Thankfully, most of com the comedians are very liberal or have, you know, not that it's even just a liberal issue, but like have a really good moral conscience in that sense and like can really think through why why these systems need to change and understand like the, the underlying roots there. So people have been putting forward some pretty thought provoking pieces around it. Um, and there might be some jokes like hidden within it, but for the most part, everyone's kind of trying to give it the airtime that it deserves. And like, it, this is not, you know, it's, it's not the time. You're right. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Once we do eventually, you know, things are things are changing. It's been incredible to watch the impact of these protests and see how there's um, like actual legislation and stuff like that that's already going through and like people are being brought to justice, which has been really wonderful to watch. So I'm like in about a month, let's say maybe two months, let's give it to be safe. You know, people will start returning to stages and stuff like that. So we're going to need to start having a you know, a funny take on it. And I have no idea what that's going to be. <laughs> it's so stressful to think about, like, you can't just ignore the fact that this happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, so so to address it, but what's <laughs> funny about it? I don't, I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's something about like posters and taking you back to the panoramas you'd make in yeah. middle school. <laughs> I, know. But I, I do actually, my one angle is, so I literally, I live in, um, but five minute walk, less than five minute walk from the Barclays Center, which has been this, it's in Brooklyn, it's the center of most of the protests, which means, and I'm one in one of those uh, like, you know, high rise areas. So there's a lot of helicopters going around all the time. The marches go by my apartment, like all the time. And I've gone to a number of them, which is great, but like they're, they're every, 
there every single day, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to, you know, make sure to work, do my job at the same time, social distance and stuff like that. Um, so I went from having no FOMO at all, you know, for all of quarantine, everyone was had to sit inside, like you were bored, everything like that, to all of a sudden I'm like, fear of missing out on a social protest that'll change the world. Like it has gone from zero to a hundred really, really, really quick. <laughs> So that's my only potential angle thus far is having yeah. to deal with like the change. No, you know what though? It's um, so the world is experiencing two things stacked on top of one another. Right. And it's like, people just need a damn break and comedy would help with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, eventually. I mean, at this point it's kind of like keep your eye on the prize. Right. And the, yeah. Cause making a difference right now. Yeah, absolutely. But doing this stuff I, the time, yeah. well, the other side is like, no one's going back to the office for, I mean, for the most part, people are the year. I have no idea, but it'll be varying amounts, but people are bored. They're so bored. <laughs> so, you know, in the next couple of months, I think people will really be itching to go to, you know, restaurants first and foremost. And then from that to like whatever shows are able to be done in a safe setting. So I'm just imagining as they're like, are there open mics via Zoom with everybody on mute so you can't gauge yeah, the line? There are, and they're terrible. <laughs> they're terrible. It's, just, yeah, it's the most painful thing you can imagine. It's just like an electronic, like, is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> Wait your little Zoom hand question. <laughs> <laughs> if only people were that tech savvy. I know. No, especially comics. You could manage it. Um, all right. Well, uh, we did want to ask you a few uh, rapid fire questions while we got here. Yeah. I do have one question before Hondo. Um, All right. Because you're a comedian, we always make fun of breaststrokers. Mm -hmm. we, we, we always say, like, you know, like when. Glenn, not because uh, you're a comedian. We don't only make fun no, of breaststrokers. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I want to know is, is it okay that, I mean, we, Glenn Mills came on and said, finally, we've had um, a breaststroke on. We normally talk about swimming on the show and things like that. Right? So, yeah. Uh, were, were you made fun of a breaststrokers? Were you guys, the fact that you can do those stretches with your knees, funny angles, the fact that you don't sprain your ankles when you walk down the street, the fact that you can do yeah you know, some co comical moments as a breaststroker that other swimmers were like, because that's something swimmers can relate to. You're like, breaststrokers? Huh? Oh, I know, yeah. No, I mean, we would, uh, my, my team didn't make fun of us necessarily, but I feel like we were always like, oh, I don't have to do that because I'm a breaststroker, so, like, I shouldn't have to do that set. Like, <laughs> what's the modification? <laughs> <laughs> we tried to, like, really milk it as much as possible and with with varying. Sometimes it'd be harder. Sometimes they would give us the same um, intervals. We're like, what the hell? <laughs> what? <laughs> this is completely <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Like, you end up doing a ton of freestyle, and I don't know how that translates to breaststroke other than aerobic value. Yeah, it gives you, you know, gets you in shape. That's team building. Very, yeah. yeah, you're right. Very little. Uh -huh. yeah, team building. But every freestyle, I challenge a breaststroke. I always challenge a breaststroke as a fifth of breaststroke. I always felt I can do it, and yeah. I was still wrong. But. <laughs> I always thought I couldn't break a minute in a hundred breaststroke. And then I made a bet with an elite women's breaststroker who shall remain nameless that I couldn't get under a minute and that I couldn't beat her in a hundred breaststroke. And then I did at a master's meet and that was all I needed. Fly kicks, baby. You couldn't make it. You were like, you shorted yourself. <laughs> I thought like, well, lap. <laughs> it's just the pullouts do so much short course. If it was know if the kicks were happening on those pullouts. By yeah, the way. exactly. Don't come after me about dolphin kicks. The <laughs> You're like, oh, Kitajima, Kitajima, Kitajima. <laughs> All right, let me ask you some rapid fire questions. Do it. Okay. okay, what's the hardest race in swimming? Um, 400 I am. How come only girls and Phelps wear parkas? <laughs> because we're the best. <laughs> ah, we're the best. Good answer. <laughs> What's that sound that Chuck Bachelor makes when he's cheering for you? <laughs> what's, what's the greatest summer league snack of all time? Oh, pixie sticks. Fact. <laughs> they sold those at meets. <laughs> for what How, come, <laughs> How come the crowd only cheers for above the water breaststroke? Mm, they do. 
Yeah, they only yell go when you're above the water. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't know this. What the hell? So, what's your go-to walkout song? What's your go-to walkout song for finals of the two bros? Oh, um, the I like DMX, so but they won't play that. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> uh, party up in here. <laughs> Oh, there you go. John's He's wearing a parka in the music video. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if your coach could let you scratch an event as a club swimmer, what event did you scratch? 200 back. There you go. That's, you don't have enough time for that. <laughs> Nobody's got time for that. I was always your knees broke the water, didn't they? <laughs> oh, it was a mess. I was back there at pressure and I was at backstroke. Oh, my gosh. That like little breaststroke kick while you're backstroking? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> breath brokers. who's your all-time favorite comic uh probably john mulaney i mean my boyfriend mm. no no don't say that <laughs> oh, <it's too> <laughs> well john prompted me on this one but butterfly was created out of breaststroke and then kitajima started turning breaststroke back into butterfly so how many underwater dolphin kicks will it take and before we just say fuck it it's one stroke <laughs> um it should just be one stroke. I'm just going to take that stand. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. Uh, how long anymore, good luck out there, guys. <laughs> how long until a woman goes 59 in the hunter brass long course? Oh, I don't. What do they go now? <laughs> I'll follow it anymore. What are they like? One of ones now? <laughs> oh, 104 now. But yeah. How long? That's, um, yeah, I don't know. Why are they getting faster still? I don't get it. Is it just all <laughs> on the water? Why are they getting faster? I, I did not feel. I was like, that's it. This is all I've got. Water <laughs> control technology. Still suit technology is Botox. <laughs> Botox to the Botox. forehead. <laughs> yeah, I should have. I wonder if that is banned. I'll look it up. I think you should. That's actually, yeah, I don't know. I think, well, hmm. I was never very informed on banned substances. And that's such a gray area anyway, but, um, things have gotten so weird. Like people are getting, uh, testing positive for like water and all this sorts of random stuff. Like, I don't know, but I don't know not to go on that wormhole, but like contaminated. <laughs> more testing positive. It seems that's for sure. rumor. You know, Mark Spitz was studied by the East Germans. So why he swam so fast? And he told him it's because of his mustache and that created yeah. a pocket of air to breathe. So the next world champs, they all showed up a mustache and he had shaved his. That's he beat them. <laughs> very funny. That's very funny. That's mind games. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, well, Laura, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Where can people find you? Yeah. Uh, you can find me on, I mean, most of my accounts are Laura Sogar at Laura Sogar. And I have a podcast uh, that talks a lot more about the comedy world, if anyone cares. Um, it's called She Does Stand Up Too. Um, and I do that with my boyfriend. So Sweet. Matthew Broussard. Mostly, please go watch Matthew Broussard stuff <laughs> because he has to pay rent. So please watch his stuff and go watch him at shows. The password poops on him. That's what I heard. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I nicely said, didn't I? I said yeah. it. I, that's the fast, that's the funniest thing that's ever happened in my life. We had just gotten the kit, and Matt was holding him, and he pooped on Matt. I was like, this is the best cat in the world. That's the cat you for children. Your children want to poop on you. Trust a me. He dub is back. A true comic. P dub. <laughs> Old P dub. Gotta pay that New York rent. Well, that's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast. Thanks so much, Laura Sogar. Uh, we'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Thanks.